first of all, I would define the acronym because uh, MMN is just letters to most people, but to those with the disease, it means a lot because it describes what is happening. It stands for multifocal motor neuropathy. I think neuropathy is the, the key word. It is a disease that affects the nerves. And the unique thing about it is that it is the first letter that stands for um, multifocal. So this affects multiple nerves in a varying uh, asymmetric often patterns, so meaning side to side differences. Certain nerves are hit in certain parts of the body. And then the middle initial in word is motor. Most neuropathies actually start in the toes and, and actually start with numbness or tingling. This is most of the neuropathies that we deal with, but MMN is very unique because it's primarily a motor neuropathy, meaning it causes primarily things like weakness, thinning of the muscles, sometimes muscle cramps, and usually it does not cause a lot of tingling or numbness, especially early in the course of the disease. Um, so the pattern, the multifocal pattern, the fact that it is primarily a motor problem, so weakness, and then the neuropathy, and, and this usually is not as acute or rapid as some of the other conditions that we deal with, like GBS or even CIDP, it usually is slower. So it can take some time for even a patient to be aware of it and for a final diagnosis. So some of the early symptoms that I would look for, certainly weakness is the primary thing that one would look for. So weakness of muscles, uh, and this can vary depending on what muscle is affected. And this is very random. Um, it can affect the arms, the legs, um, and other muscles in the body. Not as often the uh, muscles in the face or the neck or breathing muscles. Um, but uh, so primarily in the limbs, and if you look and survey patients with, GB, uh, with uh, multifocal motor neuropathy, MMN, you will s find that a lot of times the arms are, uh, are affected early on. So things like grip strength, gripping things, moving the thumbs or the fingers without numbness. So this is early in the phase, it's mainly just weakness, doing, having difficulty doing things that you could previously do. Sometimes it affects muscles higher up in the shoulders and elbow region, biceps, triceps, lifting your arm up above your head. Uh, but a lot of times the hands are one of the early places. And in the legs, it would be things like the ankles. So bring your ankle up or down. Um, and functionally, getting up and down from chairs, stairs, um, uh, maneuvering, uh, tripping. So these are all signs of weakness in different situations and this is what patients should look out for. Diagnosis of MMN is achieved um, by a triad of clinical. Uh, again, it's always the main, that's what we start with. And then uh, electrical tests, so EMG, nerve conductions, and then additional tests, which could include uh, antibodies, blood tests, and other imaging tests. Um, so in terms of the clinical findings, uh, we often look for the weakness and the pattern of weakness. We look at the reflexes, and then we just make sure that there's nothing else uh, that could be mimicking the MMN. Uh, in terms of the nerve tests, the key there is we look for something called conduction block. In fact, it is in the name, often multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block or MMN-CB. So if you see that, that's because the conduction block is key. The motor nerves have a block in them. There's some antibodies that presumably attack the nerves and cause a short circuit or an inability for that motor nerve to conduct and then weakness develops. And these electrical tests are done up and down the arm and leg to identify this. The additional tests um, can include some of these antibodies, so these are blood tests to identify what's attacking the nerves, um, and sometimes we use MRIs, not so much to diagnose MMN, that's under research, but to exclude other things that could block the nerves or damage the nerves in the spine or in the, in the arm nerves. And uh, there's some research being done on the use of ultrasound, but that is not routine yet. And uh, finally, we often will check spinal fluid to see if there's high protein. 
But that is not often uh, elevated as is the case in GBS or CIDP, but we uh, sometimes will use that as well. Early detection in MMN, as with any of our other nerve diseases, is important. Uh, and the reason is because we, use, we say in, other, in our other neurological conditions, we say time is brain. In the setting of stroke, for example, the earlier you can get to someone's stroke and try to protect the brain, the better. But I would also say time is nerve. Uh, so the earlier you can treat some of these conditions, the less chance that there will be permanent nerve damage. And have a better chance for recovery. So some of the treatments that we use, including immunoglobulins, IVIG, or subcutaneous immunoglobulin, um, can cause a quite a dramatic improvement. You can reverse some of these conduction blocks and then restore the nerve function, and the sooner we get that regular treatment in, the better. So the typical recovery from MMN, there often is an impressive response early on to something like IVIG or immunoglobulin. So people will often find, in some cases, quite almost a miraculous type improvement to their strength, whereas previously there's quite significant weakness in arms or legs or difficulty mobilizing or maneuvering. Even with after the first treatment or second treatment of IVIG, people will find a major restoration in some of the difficulties. But Ongoing from that, there can still be slower ongoing recovery because it can take time for some of those nerves to stop being damaged or attacked by the immune condition. And also for once the nerves are not exposed as much to this pathological or bad antibodies, then they can take some time to heal themselves. And that can be a more prolonged recovery over months to years. Um, but there's often a very early rapid and dramatic response and we often look for that also diagnostically to see if MMN is actually the diagnosis and then followed by ongoing recovery after that. So the types of supports that should be offered to someone um, with MMN who's undergoing treatment and um, uh, undergoing management is uh, certainly the support around the treatments themselves. So uh, intravenous immunoglobulin or subcutaneous immunoglobulin requires uh, the physicians and healthcare providers to prescribe it and ensure that someone is responding to it and is safe from the medication, tolerating it well, managing any side effects. Uh, and that also includes the nursing team uh, that is involved administering. Uh, so there's a lot of um, uh, fine tuning that occurs early on. So certainly the medical team isn't very involved in that phase. And then I think the rehabilitation team uh, is, can be involved early on, but certainly in the long run, they're, result, they're also key to help maintain and uh, optimize strength, improve flexibility, all the functional aspects that uh, you look for once the nerves do start to heal and to recover. So the residual effects of MMN are similar to what we deal with with any nerve injury. In particular with MMN, it is that of the motor nerves. So residual effects of weakness. So the residual effects um, that limit someone from doing their activities, um, anything from uh, grips and uh, arm strength, lifting things, uh, even more um, fine-tuning dexterity type things that you require your fingertips for um, and in the lower extremities similarly so weakness uh, recovery of a foot drop for example or a leg that might be dragging due to weakness so you know we hope to recover and improve some of those functions as best as possible but there's often re residual deficits and that often will affect the balance and gait uh, ability to manage with stairs getting in out of cars and then similar to the other nerve conditions, uh, pain uh, that can occur from the extra effort you have to put in to rec uh, overcome the weakness, muscle cramps that can occur, and, and fatigue. Similarly, not as much generalized fatigue, but certainly focal fatigue. So if your hand has had a lot of nerve damage, it might fatigue earlier 
than you regularly will due to the nerve damage if that has occurred. Um, so I, I would say pain, fatigue, and the cramps are also just as important as weakness. So my favorite MMN story uh, is actually part of a lot of my presentations. It's a young man who came in 10 years of symptoms of weakness, uh, both arms and legs and hands, but also the left left-sided arm and leg and uh, as a feature of MMN, this focal asymmetric weakness, really no sensory symptoms. So right away one is thinking about MMN and sure enough he was a classic case where he had conduction blocks and the high antibodies and very shortly after IVIG we were able to essentially normalize his strength completely and he went from using a walking stick and not being able to hold a job uh, because of this to full functionality you know, without any restrictions, holding a job on the treatment uh, with IVIG. And the additional um, success story from him was that we were able to transition him from intravenous immunoglobulin to subcutaneous immunoglobulin. So as some, a young person who was needing to take two days a month off, in particularly in a new job, he hadn't held a job for some time, to someone who was able to do his own treatments at home, uh, and not have that restriction certainly improved his quality of life and his ability to work and he was able to maintain on that treatment. Uh, so it really changed his life quite dramatically both to get the diagnosis and then to be on one of the newer treatments that's available. There are people out there that can help. If you don't have anyone around you there's the CIDP GBS Foundation that both in Canada and internationally, very much uh, encompasses MMN as one of their conditions that they support. There is, um, I just learned today, a thousand patient, uh, patient Facebook group that's online internationally around the world where people can access that. And the whole point of the CIDP GBS Foundation is that, is to uh, connect people, provide support, information, resources on the web, on their websites, to educate yourself about it and also connect. Uh, the, every, uh, most people that I know in that group are um, very happy to provide support to others uh, and uh, help guide them through that.